Internet Explorer 8. The browser wars, they've been waging again over the last few years with Firefox gathering quite a bit of attention amongst internet users and Opera's been chiming in here and there and even Apple with their Safari browser, they're doing their best to work their way onto PCs. Now, the good news is that us consumers, we have a reasonable choice when it comes to what browser we use. And although Microsoft does have the lion's share of the market, there are some pretty good alternatives lying around. Now, Microsoft has released Internet Explorer version 8, and although Microsoft have promised a lot of cool changes, is it worth using it if you're not a Microsoft Internet Explorer user? Or maybe you're happily using version 6 or 7, should you bother upgrading to version 8? Well, let's just say that right off the bat, Internet Explorer 8 is free. So, cost isn't an issue. But then again, I've never paid for a browser anyway, so it's probably a mute point. So is it better? Well, that's something that we'll try and address as we talk about Internet Explorer 8, which Microsoft promises will deliver greater speed and security both of which are things that most people would be pretty happy with, truth be told. Now, firstly, I will point out that IE8 is just a Windows Vista and Windows Server 2008 release. So if you aren't running either of those two operating systems, then turn around and go back. Now, if you are running Vista or 2008, then you can move on and head off to this URL that you see here, and you can download IE8 by clicking on this orange Download Now link here. Now to save time, I've already gone ahead and I've downloaded the setup file and I'll go to my desktop here where I've placed the file. So we'll double click on it and that'll start up the installation wizard. So the first thing we'll need to do here is click Next and then we'll need to accept the terms laid out in the license agreement. So we'll click the I Accept button and here we're going to leave the default to install the updates to Internet Explorer. That way we can keep it up to date against any security threats. So we'll leave that box checked, we'll click Next. And then the install wizard is going to head off online and download the updates it needs and then install IE8. Now since it does have a little bit of work to do, we're going to pause the video so you're not waiting around and we'll be back shortly. Okay, the installation is now complete and you'll note that we're told that we will need to restart our computer. So we're going to pause the video once more, we'll reboot this machine and we'll be back in a moment. Alright, we're back, our machine's been restarted and IE8 is now fully installed. Now, the first time we load up IE8, it will start up a setup wizard which lets you perform some basic configuration. Now, you can skip this step if you like, of course, you can simply click Ask Me Later and you could configure the things that this wizard is concerned about later on but let's click through it so we'll click next firstly we get the option of turning on suggested sites which is an online service that logs your browsing history in order to make personalized website suggestions now I really don't see this being all that popular amongst experienced campaigners where the desire for privacy is more important than maybe getting a list of websites that I might like but hey, I'll leave that up to you. I'm not going to turn this feature on. I'll just click Next. And now we can set up IE8 with Express Settings, which will configure our search provider. And by the way, it will retain whatever search provider you had installed before you upgraded to IE8. So if you had, say, Google set as your preferred search provider, you'd see that listed here. Now the default is to download updates as Microsoft released them we'll be using these accelerators and we're going to talk more about accelerators later on. The smart screen filter will be enabled and we'll use updates for the compatibility view and we'll discuss that later on as well. Now, if you do happen to just cancel this wizard here without choosing one of these two options, then there will be certain features that won't be enabled, for example, the smart screen filter. So it's probably a good idea to at least use the express settings and then click finish. But I'm not going to do that since this way you'll get to see what's enabled and what isn't in a default installation without using this wizard. So we'll click cancel and it's worth pointing out at this time that since IE8 has been installed and it's now replaced IE7 we we're able to launch it through the quick launch down here or from the regular start menu and when you fire up Internet Explorer for the first time you might notice that there are a few things that have changed since version 7. Now, like with version 7, there is no menu at the top of 
The window, these menu functions have been moved over to the right hand side of IE and those functions are accessible by these buttons here. Now we do have this new safety button and this green web slices button has replaced the old RSS icon we had in IE7. Uh, well, actually that's not entirely true. It will replace the RSS icon but only if the site supports web slices. And if it does, you'll see this green icon here replaced with the old familiar RSS one. Now, if you haven't been using IE7 at all and you're upgrading from IE6 or an earlier version, then you'll probably notice that right up the top here, our web page appears on a tab, which is one of the greatest features of Internet Explorer 7, which has obviously been carried over to version 8. And this is tabbed browsing. Now, tabbed browsing has been available in other web browsers like Firefox for quite a while, so it's a mature technology. And once you get the hang of using tabbed browsing, you certainly won't want to go back to the old way of doing things. So it's great that the industry has adopted it as a standard in web browsers. All right, so let's just move our thank you page here and we'll go to our default page, which you can see is currently set to MSN, but we could change that if we like. So let's first open up a new tab so we can see firstly how tabs can be useful. Now we could right click on an existing tab and we could choose new tab and you'll note here that we can also duplicate the existing tab and that's a nice touch and equally nice is the ability to reopen any closed tabs and these are tabs that you've previously closed whilst you have this session open. Now if we elect to create a new tab here for the moment, we could do it by either right clicking as you've just seen and selecting new tab, or we can click on this little small tab here on the right hand side of our larger tab and that's going to open a new tab, or we can just press Control T on our keyboard and that'll do the same thing. Now when we open up a new tab, you'll be presented with this page here which allows you to firstly reopen any tabs you've closed since you started Internet Explorer. And this will show you a list here of sites that you've visited and closed since you've had IE8 open. Now we can also set IE8 to in private mode and we're going to talk more about that in a moment. And down here we can use an accelerator and we're going to talk more about accelerators shortly as well. Once you have a few tabs open it's easy to switch back and forth between these web pages by simply clicking on the tab at the top. And this is far more user friendly than the way we used to do it which was by having dozens of IE windows on the taskbar. Now you can see we only have one item on the taskbar, but we've got lots of tabs. Now if I quickly hit Control T a few times, just to open up a few new tabs, you'll notice that these arrows appear here on the right and left hand side of our major tabs. And this simply allows you to display tabs to the left or the right if you've got more tabs than is going to fit across the top of the screen. Now if you do want to take a look at all of the web pages you have open in IE, you can click this little icon here, the one with the four squares on the left hand side, or press Control Q on your keyboard, and this will show you a single page with all of the pages that you currently have open. Now from here you can click on the little X at the top of each thumbnail to close them, or you could right click on them and choose to close it that way, or we could right click and choose to close all of the tabs bar this one that we have selected, and of course we could refresh this particular page or refresh all of them. Now if you do want to view one of these pages, simply left click on it and it will bring that tab to the front. All right, now when we opened up a new tab, it showed us this new tab window like you see here. So let's customize this so that way it's going to open up something else and preferably this will be your home page. So we're going to click on the tools menu here on the top right of our IE window and at the bottom we're going to choose Internet Options and over here under the Tabs heading we'll click the Settings button. Now up the top here you can see the default is to enable tabbed browsing and of course that setting is enabled and I can't see any reason why you'd want to turn it off but of course you can if you absolutely must. Now next the default is to warn us when we choose to close multiple tabs and this is a good thing because the last thing you want to have happen is to accidentally close down IE and you, you haven't either read or added a page to your favorites. And this setting will throw up a dialog box asking us if we're sure we want to close IE as long as you have at least two tabs open in IE. So to ensure you don't accidentally close IE and lose all your pages, I'd advise that you leave this box checked. 
Now, whenever you create a new tab using Control T or you Control click on a link, the web page will not be made the active tab, but you certainly can change this by checking the next box here. Now, enable quick tabs. That's the page that showed us all of our tabs in a thumbnail that we just saw a moment ago. Now, you can turn that feature off if you like. Okay, the next setting here is to only open the first home page when IE starts. Now, this brings us to another feature of IE. You can set multiple home pages. Now, the truth is it really isn't multiple home pages as such, but it will allow you to create a list of default web pages that you can open automatically when you start IE. Now, this is a good feature for obvious reasons because it enables you to start IE and have all of the websites that you normally go to all automatically fired up. But the downside, and yeah, there's always a downside, is that for every page you choose to fire up, the longer IE will take to load before it hands off control to you. So let's cancel this for a moment and we'll go and take a look at how this feature works. Now firstly, let's fire up a couple of web pages. Now we've already got MSN open here, so let's fire up Yahoo. Now we'll also open up another page. We'll open up Google. And let's do one more. We'll open up Microsoft.com as well. And in case you're wondering, to get IE to automatically add in the rest of the URL, I'm just hitting Control and Enter. And that's filling in the HTTP and the .coms as well. So now we've got four or five sites loaded in IE spread across a bunch of tabs. And let's just close these spare ones. Now, a word of warning, like I said, adding too many new sites to your home page tabs will affect the startup time of IE. So do take particular care when using this feature on your computer. So over here on the right, we're going to click on this little drop down arrow here and we're going to say add or change our home page. And you can see we have three options here. We could use this web page as our only home page. We could add this page to our home page tabs, or we could use the current tab set as our home page. So let's just use the first one for now. We're going to make Microsoft.com our only home page. So we'll click yes. And now if we come up and click on the little down arrow icon again, we can see here that our first home page is now Microsoft's website. So if we go and click on the little uh, Internet Explorer icon here in our quick launch area. It's going to open up a new browser with our home page loaded by default, which of course is Microsoft.com. Okay, well, let's go and click on the little down arrow icon again and we'll choose to remove the Microsoft site as our home page and we'll say yes. Okay, now let's go and select another tab. Let's say the Yahoo tab and we'll click on the little down arrow icon again and we'll choose to add or change our home page. And again, we'll choose the top option and we'll say yes. Now this time when we fire up a new copy of Internet Explorer, this time we can see that Yahoo has replaced Microsoft's website as our home page. All right, well let's close this and we're back at our other browser again. This time we'll click on the MSN tab and we'll go to our home page options again and we'll choose add or change. Now this time we'll choose the second option here to add this web page to our home page tabs and we'll say yes. Now we'll go and open up a new browser again. Now this time IE opens up with both MSN and Yahoo as our home page tabs, but since Yahoo is the default home page, it becomes the active tab. By the way, if we choose to close IE here, since we've got two or more tabs open, you can see that we get the warning message asking us if we're sure we want to close all of the tabs or just the current one. So let's close all of them and we'll click on the little down arrow icon again and we'll choose add or change one more time. Now the last option here is to add every single tab to our home pages. So let's select this bottom option and we'll say yes. And we'll go and close our browser down and we'll open it up again. And this time you can see we've got five sites opening automatically. So whilst this is a good feature, I'd suggest being careful that this is really what you want to do as you don't want to be sitting there waiting for heaps and heaps of sites to be loading 
every time you open IE. And yes, even though IE8 is definitely quicker than other versions of IE, it'll still be bogged down if you throw up too many tabs. All right, well, let's go and click on Tools, Internet Options again, and we'll go back to our tab settings. And the next feature we have enabled here by default is Tab Groups. Now, Tab Groups are a really cool way of color coding tabs to visually identify that a group of tabs has something in common. So let's cancel these two windows again and we'll go and see what we mean. So we'll open up a new tab and we'll go to a new site. Let's go to the winstructor.com website. Now what we'll do is we'll right click here and we'll open up in a new tab one of the links off this site and You'll notice now that we've got two tabs here, both coming from the Winstructor website, and they're both highlighted in green. Now this visually identifies that these two tabs are grouped together. So if we go over to MSN tab here, and let's just right click on one of these hyperlinks here, and we'll open that in a new tab. You'll notice that both of these two tabs are now grouped in a blue color. And of course, if we click on Yahoo, and we go and open up, another tab from there, you can see that these are both yellow. Now that's groups, visually making it easy to identify which tabs belong to one another. Now the other cool part of this is that if we also right click on one of these tabs, and let's use one of the Winstructor ones here, we'll right click on it. Now we could choose to close the whole tab group if we like. Now we could also choose to close all of the tabs except this one, and of course we could just close this tab by itself. So let's choose to close this tab group and all of the Winstructor pages, which of course were the green tabs, are now gone. Pretty cool, isn't it? All right, well, let's go back and click on Tools, Internet Options, and we'll go back to our tab settings. Now the next setting we have allows us to decide what happens when a new tab is opened. Are we gonna open that on a new tab page, a blank page, or our first home page. Now the default here is the new tab page and that's fine by me, although you could easily set that to your first home page and if your home page happens to be something like Google, every time you hit Control T or open up a new tab using one of the other methods, it's always gonna to default to displaying Google. Now, when a pop-up is encountered, the default here is to open pop-ups in a new window, but we could certainly change that to let IE decide how pop-ups should be handled or to open up pop-ups in a new tab, which is my personal preference. And the last item down here is to open links from other programs in a new tab in the current window, or we could open up a new copy of IE, or replace whatever we have open in our existing tab. Now finally at the bottom here, if you totally muck up any of these settings here and you don't know what they were, you can always restore the defaults as well. Now, since we've been talking about home pages, You'll note at the top of this window here, you can enter in a list of home pages if you like. And if you want to use more than one home page, then you have to enter in each one on a new line. Now, since I've got five of them here, I might take the opportunity to just delete a few of them. Now, down underneath this, we can see the heading Browsing History. And here we can choose to delete any temporary or otherwise personal information from IE. So we'll click on the Delete button. And from this window, we're able to delete temporary internet files, our cookies. We can remove the history from our browser, so that way our boss or our significant other can't see what websites we've been visiting. Now we can also remove any data that we might have entered into forms, things like our name and address and credit card information. And we can delete any passwords we may have chosen to save when we log into protected sites. And down the bottom here, we can also choose to delete in private data that the in private feature uses to identify sites that attempt to share details about you. Now, speaking of this in private feature, this is one of the new cool features of IE8. One of the big issues with internet access and computers in general is the amount of personal data that your computer and websites grab about you and whether they share that data with other people or not is probably irrelevant. It's the whole privacy thing that irritates people. Like another browser, Google Chrome, IE8 features a privacy mode called In Private, which allows the user to safely browse the web 
without IE collecting information about you and the sites that you're visiting. So up the top on the right here, we're going to click on the safety menu and we'll choose in private browsing. Now this will open up a new browser here in the in private mode and that's clearly visible at the top here. Now this means that cookies, temporary internet files, your browsing history and other things will not be locked. Now even though on the internet and various forums this in private mode is also called the adult site mode since well I suppose it probably will be used for that purpose since IE won't log where you've been and what you've seen. Now I will stress though for those of you who might be thinking hey I could use this feature to browse sites that my work wouldn't ordinarily allow. Now I would warn you that even though IE8 won't leave incriminating data about your activities your proxy logs probably will so bear that in mind as good a feature as this is it's not a substitute for common sense. So you just browse sites as you normally would and when you're done you can close IE8 and you'll be back to browsing in normal mode. Now another cool feature of in private is the filtering option so we'll click on safety and we'll select filtering and that'll turn filtering on but what does it do? Well let's click safety again and we'll choose the option underneath in private filtering settings and that'll throw up this new window here that does go some way to helping explain what this filtering feature is all about. Now simply put filtering is a way that you can filter domains that are grabbing content from a third party site. So for example let's say you visit a site like CNN.com which just so happens to display ads from other sites. It's these unsolicited ads that will be blocked by this filtering technology. So let's go and take a practical look. Now down the bottom here I'm actually going to set this value here to something a little lower for the purposes of this exercise and I'm going to set it to 3 which you can see is the lowest and this means that after the third time that I've had third party content shoved in my face well I'll be able to choose whether I want to block it or allow it. Now the default here means that I will be choosing whether I want to block or allow the content however I can choose to automatically block it or just turn this feature off altogether. Now just to fast track this I've gone ahead and I've browsed to a bunch of sites that behind the scenes are sharing data with third party sites and you can see the results here in this window. So the sites that I visited are displaying third party content from these people. Now this gives us the ability to block these third party ads from appearing in my browser. Now for some people this will be really cool technology perhaps not so cool if you're the advertiser but as far as I'm concerned I really don't want to see ads littered about the sites that I visit so if I can block them great. The repercussion of this of course is that if this filtering technology takes off it does mean that unless you have advertising on the actual domain where the ad appears then it could easily be otherwise blocked and never seen as this feature blocks third party content only. And with Google Ads appearing on just about every site you come across quite frankly it's great to be able to get rid of them. Now down the bottom of this window here you'll notice that we're able to click on this little padlock icon here and that'll turn our in private filtering feature on or off. And on the right hand side we can click the little arrow here and then change the settings as we like. Okay well up the top here the other option we have on our safety menu is smart screen filter which is the new name for the phishing filter that we got in IE7. And I really don't know why this isn't turned on by default to be honest. In fact I don't understand why the in private features we've already discussed aren't turned on by default either since they all work together to improve your security and privacy something that Microsoft have been touting for some time now. Anyway well to turn on this smart screen filter we'll just need to choose to turn it on and then we'll leave the default here to turn it on and click OK. And now IE8 will protect us against phishing attacks by automatically checking sites you go to against a list of known phishing sites which is maintained by Microsoft. Now phishing site by the way it's just a website that attempts to extract personal information from you mostly for malicious purposes. 
Now, you might have been the recipient of phishing attempts before. In fact, you probably have. You probably had an email or two claiming to be from a bank or from PayPal or eBay telling you that you have to click on this link and change your password or your account's going to be suspended or something bad's going to happen. Of course, if you do click that link, it'll take you to a website which might look like the original one, but it certainly isn't. So an unsuspecting user is going to try to log on and the bad guys now have your password. Look, the general rule has always been to never click on these links, but a lot of people still do it. And if you're unsure if it's legit or not, you can normally tell from an email that has a link. If you hover your mouse over it in Microsoft Outlook, this will show you the real URL, which is normally an IP address, not the bank, not paypal.com, not ebay.com, not whoever you thought it might have been. Now further to this, you might have also noticed that with IE8, any site you visit, up here at the top in the address bar, you can see the domain is listed in black and the rest of the URL is shown in grey. Now this helps you identify what the real domain of the site is. Now like I said, normally phishing attacks appear to be coming from eBay or PayPal or, or someone known, but they're really going elsewhere. So this is really just another subtle but effective touch here and I reckon it's a good one. So this smart screen filter is built into IE and it really should be turned on by default like it was in IE7 and I reckon that turning it on is a good idea. In fact, if you had, I've run through that wizard when we first loaded IE8, it would have turned it on anyway. Now if you do want to happen to check the site that you're currently on, in this case Microsoft.com, we'll choose Safety, Smart Screen Filter, and then we'll choose Check This Site. Now if you do happen to come across a known website that Microsoft has determined to be a phishing site, it will block you from entering in any personal details. If they're unsure though, it'll be flagged as suspicious and you'll simply get a warning. And in those cases, the address bar in IE at the top here is going to change to this pinky red background and that'll give you a visual cue that something's wrong. So this smart screen filter is a good thing to help you in the fight to keep your privacy. Now speaking of privacy, if we go back and click on Tools menu again and then Internet Options and we'll go and take a look at our Browsing History Settings now IE stores web pages and images and media in the IE cache to make retrieving the same page again quicker the second time around. But we can get IE to check if a newer item exists and that could be a newer updated web page or anything that's changed on the page that we're trying to load. Now IE will by default automatically check to see if anything's changed but you can change this to check only every time we visit the web page every time we start Internet Explorer or to never check. But in most cases, I'd probably just leave the default as it is. Now we can also set how much disk space will allow this cache to utilize. The default here is 50 meg, but we could change this to as little as 8 meg all the way up to a gig. Now the cache by default is stored in this location in our users folder, followed by the name of the person who we're logged on as, and I'm logged on using the trainer account. App Data Local Microsoft Windows Temporary Internet Files. And if we click on the Move Folder button, we can then move this folder to another location if you like. Now, if you do want to take a look at any downloaded files, you can click on View Objects button or click on the View Files button. And this will simply open up Windows Explorer at the correct folder. And that just saves you having to manually go and find this folder here. Now our last option down the bottom here is where we can specify how long IE will retain a list of places you've been and by default of course that's set to 20 days. However if you're using the in private feature we've just talked about then it's not going to store any history information at all. Now our next option here is to change our search defaults as well and that refers to using this pane here up in the top right of Internet Explorer, which you can see does default to Windows Live, which is Microsoft Windows Live service. Now you see, here we only have one search provider by default, and that's to use Microsoft Live Search. And we can set the default one if we happen to have more than one in the list here, and we can just select it and choose to set it as the default, or we could remove it from the list as well. Now if you do want to add in more search providers here, you can click on this little hyperlink on the bottom left and this will take you off 
to another website, the ieaddons.com site, and we can add in, say, Google by clicking on this link here, and this will open up a new dialog box where we can now choose to add Google, and we can even make it our default search provider if we like, so we'll click on Add there. So now that we've added in Google, you notice up here on the top right, Google is now the default search, and anything that we type in here will automatically be sent off as a Google search. Now this also is a good site to remember by the way because they do have quite a few different providers not for only typical search engines but also for other places like eBay and Facebook and other popular sites. Alright well let's go back to our search providers here and you'll notice that Google isn't listed here so we'll quickly need to close this and go and open it again and up the top here you can now see that Google is the default so let's go and make the second one, the live search, the default. So we'll select that and we'll choose to set it as the default. And now this time, live search will be searched when we enter something in, in the bar at the top right. Now, speaking of this bar here at the top right of IE, which by default, of course, does use live search. If we click on the drop down arrow icon on the right, we can manually select any of the other providers we might have from the list here. Or we could choose to manage our search providers and then select whatever search providers we want from the list. And again, we could choose to set it as the default. So either way, whether you do it from this settings window there or you choose one manually here, it's pretty much the same thing. Now, if you do also want to add in more search providers, you can click on this down arrow icon again and then choose to find more providers and that's going to take you off to the same website that we saw a moment ago. All right, well, now that we have our search providers configured, we can now use this search bar here to automatically search our favorite search engine. And a little tip here, if you type something into this search bar, let's just type in test, and you hit Alt and Enter, it'll open up that search in a brand new tab. All right, well, Let's just close this tab, we'll go back to our Tools menu, and let's take a look at what other options we have. All right, well, firstly, you can see we've got a pop-up blocker that's inbuilt to IE, and we've got options here to turn it off, which, of course, I don't recommend, and the pop-up settings. So let's choose Settings, and here you can see it allows us to add in a list of sites that we know has pop-ups, but we want to allow them to pop up. So you can simply enter in a URL here and then click on the Add button. Now by default, IE will play a sound and show its little drop-down yellow bar at the top when it does block a pop-up. And that yellow bar, by the way, you could right-click on that and choose to allow the pop-up if you like. Now, if you absolutely hate the sound that IE plays when it blocks a pop-up, you can change it. Now, if you click on Start, and choose control panel and then the green hardware and sound link and we'll choose change system sounds now if we scroll down a little bit here's the blocked pop-up window sound so if you select that then you can click browse and then go and select a different sound which is more to your liking all right well Back to our pop-ups here, the default is set to medium and this will block most pop-ups, but you can set this to high if you like to block all of them, or low, which will allow pop-ups from secure sites like banks, but it'll block all the others. Okay, now our other option here on our tools menu is to manage any Internet Explorer add-ons such as third-party toolbars and other utilities that are designed for IE. Now if we select one of the add-ons here, in this case we only have one default add-on here, the XML one, we can choose to disable it or enable it using these buttons below. Now another feature of IE is to allow it to work offline and we can also switch on compatibility mode which is something new in IE8 and it's designed to display websites in IE7 mode just in case they don't render properly in IE8. Now the buzz on this one is that historically Internet Explorer 
hasn't been really compliant when it came to standards. Well, that's not really just the buzz, it's, it's true. Now this means that in the past, IE would render pages differently than other web browsers, often meaning that a web developer would have to include special instructions just so the page would render correctly in IE. With IE8, the legend is that it's now much more standards compliant so that most sites should render fine, but the compatibility mode exists to kick IE back into version 7 mode. Now, if you come across a site that doesn't display correctly in normal mode, you can throw it into compatibility mode to see if it fixes the rendering issues. So let's select another site here. Let's select Yahoo. And in our tools menu, we can choose compatibility view. But notice at the top here, next to our stop and refresh buttons, we've got this new broken page icon. And this is also where you can turn on compatibility mode. So we'll give that a click. And you'll note here that, especially in this case, in the case of Yahoo, it's now identified that we're running an IE7 mode and it's recommending that we upgrade to version 8. Now, the truth is, of course, that we are running IE8, but it's in IE7 compatibility mode and that's full Yahoo. Now, if, by the way, you do have a site that doesn't render in IE, but it does render fine in IE7 compatibility mode, well, rather than clicking this mode each time you load the site, you can add it to a list of sites that will always load in compatibility mode. So let's click on Tools again and we'll choose Compatibility View Settings. And from this window here, you can add in URLs for sites that you always want to view in compatibility mode. Now down here, we can display intranet sites in compatibility view and that's set by default. Now there's an option here to display all sites in IE7 mode which is probably not necessary but the options there. And our final option here is to include updated website lists from Microsoft. Now if we check this box then IE8 will consult a list of sites that are known to have problems running in IE8 mode. And if you want to view that list We'll click close and up the top here in our address bar we'll type in the following line. I'm not going to read that out there and we'll hit enter. And here you'll be able to view a list of the sites that Microsoft has included that will by default be running in IE7 compatibility mode. Okay, well moving on now, like in IE7, IE8 also supports RSS feeds. Now whilst RSS feeds aren't a particularly new thing. Previous versions of IE didn't support RSS feeds, so you had to move to a third-party product. And RSS, just in case you don't know what it is, stands for really simple syndication, and this is a method of subscribing to a frequently updated website. That way, the latest news and articles or blog posts, they're automatically downloaded for you to read. So if we point our browser to a site that supports feeds, and I can think of one that does, that's winstructor.com, if IE detects that this website is offering a feed that you can subscribe to, then this icon here will change to orange, indicating that a feed's available. So if we click on the icon, it'll take you to the page where you can now subscribe to the feed, and over here, on the top left hand side of the site you can see the link here to subscribe. So we'll click this and this will bring up a new window where we can save a link to the feed just like we'd save a regular old favorite. So in this case we'll be saving a feed to Winstructor and the default here is to save it inside our feeds folder but we could certainly create a new folder here if we like. So I'm just going to click subscribe and now we're subscribed to this feed and any updated content will be automatically downloaded by IE when it's available. And to view these feeds, we'll click on the yellow star icon here, and you can see that that defaults to our favorites. So we'll select the Feeds tab, and we can choose a feed from the list, and if a new article has been released, then our feed favorite here will turn to bold, indicating that there's new content available. Now if we right-click, on any of our feeds in the list here and choose properties. The default behavior of IE8 is to check once a day 
for any new content but we can change that if we like by clicking on the settings button and we can change that to more or less frequently now the default here is to automatically mark a feed as read when we are reading the feed and we can see that feed reading view is also turned on by default which is what you see here now if you do happen to uncheck this box then you're going to see just like an XML page return rather than this nicely formatted document now we can also choose to play a sound if we find a feed on a web page that we like as well as when a monitored feed is updated and for now I'm just going to make mention of this bottom option here turn on in page web slice discovery as we will talk about web slices in just a moment so we'll cancel this for now you'll note here that we can also automatically download any attached files to the feed such as where an author of an article might reference a file such as a podcast or an executable file and if you do enable this option then you can click on the view files button here and go and check out the files that you've downloaded now at the bottom here we can set the maximum number of updates we want to save for this feed and the default here is set to 200 but we can change this anywhere up to 2500 now when we go to view our feed over here on the right we could choose to filter this out by date or by title so if we click title you'll see here that our list here has changed into alphabetical order now we can also use this search box at the top let's just type in something like IAS and we'll hit enter and you can see now that it's only showing the articles that have the word IIS in them now and from this list here if we do choose we want to click on any of the links it's going to take us straight to the article on the actual website so these feeds are pretty useful since they don't go and download the entire article it's only a small bit of text so there's not a lot of downloading that you're doing and you can see at a glance what takes your interest and then go directly to the article without having to manually go and search a particular website and of course whilst you're here now you can print or email or add this web page to your favorites if you like and speaking of favorites one of the tips that people seem to like is this rather useful one regarding favorites let's say you want to keep a copy of this Winstructor page here in fact let's just go to the home page of Winstructor first since most people are more likely to bookmark or favorite their home page so let's say that I want to add this to my favorite since it's a place that I'm likely to go to a lot now favorites in IE8 are a little different and you might be wanting to click this little yellow star icon here with the green arrow but in IE8 this isn't the add to favorites icon like it was in IE7 the actual icon is a yellow star with a green plus symbol over the top not this green arrow now this has been moved in IE8 if we click on favorites you'll see the icon here add to favorites now it's just a little subtlety but it is a trap for new players in fact this new icon by the way here the yellow star with the green arrow allows you to dock a favorite to the bar at the top here which is nice for all those sites you visit all of the time all right so let's go and add Winstructor to our favorites so we'll click on favorites and we'll choose add to favorites but instead of leaving the name at whatever the title bar of the page is let's just call this one win win short for Winstructor and we'll click add and by the way of course if you did prefer you can use control D on the keyboard to add a favorite as well but I'm sure you already knew that one so let's just now go and close this browser window and we'll open up a new one complete with the five tabs which we still haven't fixed up yet and now of course we have to wait for those five tabs to load I told you it was a pain and in our address bar now we're simply going to type in win and we'll hit enter and what loads the Winstructor homepage of course that we just favorited a moment ago so that's rather cool now the only real requirement for this to work is that when you do choose to save your favorite you must save it in the root of your favorites folder otherwise this simply won't work so if you've created a folder here let's just say Windows Live this folder and I chose to create this favorite in that folder 
then it won't work. But still, it is a nice tip and it does save a lot of typing. All right, now whilst we're on the subject of favorites, if we click on the favorites button and then choose the history tab, you can see here we can search through our browsing history by date, by site, by the sites that we visited most frequently, in the order that we visited sites today, or we can just search our history as well. Now, whilst this might be a privacy issue as some people don't like to leave a trail of where they've been, personally I think this is also a pretty nifty feature. As often, myself, I've gone to a website, later in the day, I realized I've forgotten to add it to my favorites, and now for the life of me, I can't remember what the site was. Now, if I was to click on, say, the order I visited today, here's a list of all the sites that I've gone to today, and that, of course, is going to hold the site that I'm looking for. Now, of course, if I opt to display these by, say, date, then I can go back further than a day as well. All right, well, let's move on now, and we're going to talk a little bit about IE security, since this is the area in the past that Microsoft hasn't had the best track record on. But they've tried really hard to improve, and it certainly shows. Now, in IE7, that's when Microsoft introduced some features like the pop-up blocker, the phishing filter, which is now called Smart Screen Filter, of course, and protected modes, whereby giving you the ability to block websites from automatically attempting to install ActiveX controls. Now in IE8, we've got the In Private Editions, which is great. And if we click on the Tools menu and select Internet Options and then the Security tab. If you're familiar with earlier versions of IE, you'll see this is all the same as it was back in IE6. We've still got our Internet, our local intranet, trusted sites and restricted sites zones. So to add URLs into any of these zones, you'll simply select the zone at the top here and then click on the sites button to add in the link. So the way this works for those of you that haven't played around with zones is that for our internet zone this defines the settings to all destinations on the web excluding those URLs that are found in the trusted sites and the restricted sites zones. Now down the bottom of this window here we can see this slider bar that the internet zone defaults to, which is currently medium high security. Now if we slide this bar up or down, the description of what this security level allows is going to change so you can see how increasing or decreasing security for this zone will affect your browsing experience. Of course, if you do happen to be joined to a domain, you can override these settings using group policy. Now the local intranet zone refers to all sites that are found on your internal network such as your own internal web server or you might have a SharePoint portal server. Trusted sites are sites that you obviously know and you trust not to be harmful although downloading potentially unsafe code will still prompt you. Now finally we have restricted sites and that allows you to define sites that will be blocked without hesitation. Now if you do want to modify any of these zones you can click on the custom level button and you can run through this rather long list here and enable or disable whatever you like and as you can see it is rather a long list so I'm going to leave that up to you. Now on our next tab, the privacy tab, we can further set how we want to handle cookies downloaded from websites from our internet zone. Now the default here is set to medium which does allow cookies unless they fall into any of these categories here. Now, a cookie, just in case you don't know what it is, is simply a text file that contains a little bit of data about you, such as your username, any site preferences, and when you last visited. Now, if you do want to override these defaults here for a particular website, you can click on the Sites button, and then enter in a URL here, and then choose to allow all cookies or block them entirely. Now, if you have saved your preferences for handling cookies, you can choose to import them, to bring them in to IE8 and if we click on the advance button we can define how we want to handle cookies and if we check this box here then we'll override the automatic cookie handling options that we just saw on the previous page. So here we can configure how we want to handle first party and third party cookies. Now a first party cookie is one that's set by the actual website that we're visiting whereas 
A third party cookie is normally set by a link on the page of the site that you're visiting, such as an advertiser on a banner ad. So here you can choose to accept them all or to block them or to prompt you what you want to do. Now at the bottom here we can also accept session cookies which are cookies that supposedly are not persistent. In other words they shouldn't be saved and they only stay on your system whilst you're logged into a website for example and they should be deleted when you log out. Now obviously it doesn't always work this way for example if you close the browser without logging out of a website often these sorts of cookies don't crumble and they stay on your hard drive. Now next on the content tab we could also use the content advisor to lock down access so people can't view websites that contain unsavory material like adult material or sites that contain violence. Now if we click on the enable button we can view the ratings that have been defined by the ICRA which is an international non-profit body called the International Content Rating Association and what they do is they classify websites into categories and here you could choose to allow or block content based on its category. So rather than having to try and find and list every conceivable website in a block list, you can simply block a category. Now obviously this isn't infallible as it does rely on the destination website to have a content rating defined. Now you can see a whole bunch of different categories defined here. Now if we just click on OK and accept these default settings and thus turning this ratings feature on, we'll firstly need to enter in a supervisor password before we can continue. So I'm going to enter in a password here and we'll need to type it in again just to confirm it. And we can also enter in a password hint and in fact if we don't we'll just click on OK it will prompt us to go and enter in a password hint but I'm going to ignore this I'm going to say no. Alright now we'll get a message here just telling us that the content advisor has been enabled. So now if we go and try and load a new website and let's just use Yahoo as an example again you can see the content advisor has now been kicked into action and it's blocked access to the site. Now sure I can allow access to this page or the site if I happen to know the password but in order to make this perhaps still effective for children but flexible enough to allow regular web surfing it's going to need a bit of configuration. So if we go back to our tools menu again and choose internet options and then the content tab and then the settings button and then we'll enter in our supervisor password and click OK. Now we'll click on the general tab and here we can allow users to view sites that don't have a content rating and you're probably going to find that a lot of them don't. So now if we click on OK and then OK again and we'll go back and we'll try and reload Yahoo This time it lets us view the page. Now it's been my experience that a lot of people really don't use this feature of IE but if you're really concerned about children visiting sites you really don't want them to then you can come in here and take a look. And of course don't forget the parental features of Windows Vista. Now most of the other options that we have in IE will most likely cover in other videos as they really relate to using other applications. For example, if we click on the tools menu again and choose internet options and then say the connections tab, this is where we can set up things like a dial up or a VPN connection. And if we click on LAN settings at the bottom, this is where we can configure IE to use a proxy server. Although in most cases, if you're going to populate these details here, then you'll most likely use group policy anyway. Now on our programs tab we can check to see if IE is the default browser each time we load it and if it's not it'll pop up a dialog box and ask us if we want to change it back to the default browser and of course we can come in here and click the make default button as well. Now we can manage add-ons and we've seen that before. We can set the default editing program that IE 
will use when you choose to edit a web page and this drop down box will list any applications you have that are capable of editing HTML. Things like Microsoft Front Page or Dreamweaver and of course in my case Notepad. Now we can also configure which applications we want to use for other internet services and this really isn't an IE feature per se. This simply loads up a control panel applet which lets you configure what applications you're going to use for things like email and playing audio and video and so forth. Now finally on the advanced tab like in previous versions of IE we can configure the advanced properties and set how we want to configure things like printing for example and browsing security and accessibility options and in most cases you'll probably not want to change most of these but come in here and take a look anyway as there are some settings that are quite useful. Okay well the last thing I want to cover in this video is a couple more features of IE called web slices and accelerators and both of which are new in IE8. Now web slices allow you to subscribe to certain parts of a website and receive notifications whenever that page is updated right inside IE8. Now firstly though in order for web slices to be available the site you want to use them with needs to support them. Now since this is new technology you'd expect the uptake right now to be rather low but that's going to change with some high profile sites like eBay getting on board. So imagine this scenario and we'll use eBay as the example. Imagine you're bidding on an auction. In order for you to be notified as soon as you're outbid there's only really one solution and that's to sit on the eBay page and keep hitting F5 to refresh the page. Now using an eBay web slice you could be instantly notified of any changes to the auction live as they happen. So if we go and point our browser to ie8.ebay.com you'll note here that eBay is supporting an IE8 release with three main features here a search provider which we've talked about an accelerator which we'll talk about in a moment and a web slice. Now it's this web slice which will allow you to keep track of your auctions as things change and you're going to see those changes directly in your favorites bar at the top of IE8. So let's go and test out a web slice and for this test I won't use a specific web slice like this I'm going to use another method of creating a web slice that allows us to track RSS feeds. So let's go and open up a new browser and we'll close a few of these tabs we don't need and we're going to head off to liveslices.com slash gallery.aspx and we'll locate the RSS feed slice and we'll click on the install button here and I'm going to say no I don't want to sign up so we'll say no and here we'll need to enter in the feed URL so this is simply the URL to an RSS feed so since we've already used Winstructor's own website as an example let's use that one again so I'm gonna fire up the Winstructor website and we'll click on the RSS icon and now I'm just gonna simply copy this URL to the Windows clipboard and we'll go back to our live slices site and I'm going to paste that URL here inside our feed URL field and then we'll click on the verify feed button alright well the feed has been verified and it's all good so now we'll click on the install now button and then the add to favorites bar now at the top of IE8 you can see that we've got a web slice that points to the winstructor.com website and it's sitting right here at the top of Internet Explorer and it's going to show us in bold text when there's new updates to this feed and in fact I'd encourage you to do that just what I've done here that way you guys will be notified when Winstructor has new videos and products released as they will use this mechanism to advise their customers so set it up if you're using IE8 or use the RSS feed feature if you're still stuck in IE7. Now the final thing I want to talk about in this video are accelerators. 
Accelerate is a way that you can select text or other objects on a web page and then send them to another web service. So for example, let's say I've just come across a web page that has an article on a brand new Plasma TV. Now using that keyword of Plasma TV, I could highlight it with my mouse and I could send it off to eBay for a search within eBay. Now I could highlight and send an address to Google Maps or some text from another site to a blog. In fact, let's head off to the Internet Explorer page from Microsoft's website because I do recall that if we scroll down they do have their address listed here so I'm simply going to highlight this address and you'll notice here that this little blue icon appears so we'll click that icon and up pops a bunch of different accelerators so from here since this is an address if we hover our mouse over the map with live search option look what happens we get a map showing us the address that we've highlighted pretty cool and it's very easy to do and there was no copying the address and pasting it into a mapping application so although in essence these accelerators really are just a glorified automatic copy and paste technology but still it's much nicer to use these accelerators than doing things the old way the practical use of these accelerators really are unlimited I guess but they do depend on people writing accelerators for use. But like with web slices, I think you'll start seeing these things popping up all over the place. Now, speaking of popping up all over the place, let's just point our browser to ieaddons.com. And I wanted to point out this site for those of you that have never been here before, since here is where you're going to find a whole bunch of add-ons for IE. And many of these add-ons are specific to IE8 only, including web slices and you got it, accelerators. So if we go and click on accelerators and take a quick look through here, you're going to find some cool accelerators for things like Facebook, you'll see Google, Blogger, YouTube and so forth. And in the web slices section, you're going to find web slices for top sites like Microsoft, The Weather, eBay, traffic sites, ESPN, and much more. Okay, well in this video we've taken a long and detailed look at Internet Explorer version 8. Now, as you've seen, a fair bit has changed in this new release of Internet Explorer, and at least in my opinion, it's all for the better. It's got new security features, a great privacy mode, web slices, color-coded tabs, domain highlighting, and generally it's faster all round, so in my experience it's a massive upgrade from IE7 and a good alternative to Firefox if you happen to have jumped ship. So it's definitely worth taking a look at IE8 since it costs nothing, it'll live happily alongside Firefox anyway, so I'd say give it a shot. I think you'll be happy with what IE8 has to offer. So we hope you've enjoyed this video and would like to thank you for watching.